Hippocrates, peri aeron, hudaton, topon, de aera, aquis, et locis. You've watched and hopefully studied Comenius on the creation, the firmament, the four elements, stones, and metals, and are about to enter the animate world of plants, animals, and man. Hippocrates' Airs, Waters, Places is an ideal vehicle to impress yourself with the vocabulary you've already learned, and on its own terms, it is one of the most interesting works in the Hippocratic corpus, which is our main window into ancient medicine. I say Hippocratic corpus. In reality, we know almost nothing first about the historical person. He was said to be from the island of Kos. He is often referred to as Hippocrates of Kos, and to have lived around the time of Pericles. Second, of the many medical treatises collected and passed down together under the name Hippocrates, we don't know for sure which were actually written by Hippocrates. This was controversial even in antiquity. Airs, Waters, Places belongs to a subset of the Hippocratic corpus that at least some call the genuine Hippocrates, though the view of scholars is not unanimous. Airs, Waters, Places is essentially divided into two halves. The first half discusses the impact of environmental conditions such as winds and waters and the changes of seasons on health. The second, the places in the title, examines the perceived differences in physical characteristics between the peoples of Asia and Europe. It is a fascinating specimen of ancient ethnography, though it doesn't have much to do with medicine. For our purposes, we're going to present the first half, 11 chapters, in 11 separate videos. As a heads up, I will be spending a little more time in the first two videos in order to provide background and context. Consistent with our purpose in presenting equivalent Latin and Greek, we utilize an important Latin translation of AWP by the physician Janus Cornarius, originally published in 1545. And to make the point about your already awesome achievements, I underline in the displayed text all the Greek and Latin vocabulary you've learned from the Comenius topics to date. You may well want to purchase the inexpensive Evan Hayes Stephen Nimus edition of AWP, which also contains the famous Hippocratic Oath. It is an entry in the author's series of intermediate Greek readers with plenty of vocabulary and grammatical help on each page. It mostly uses the Greek text of the 1923 Loeb edition translated by W.H.S. Jones. Note, though, that we are getting our Greek text from the two outstanding modern critical editions, Hans Diller's 1970 edition for the German Corpus Medicorum Graecorum which also has a German translation, and Jacques Juana's 1996 edition for the Boudet series, reissued in 2003, with a French translation and extensive introduction and commentary. For English, you may want the Penguin Classics paperback edition of Hippocratic Writings, which also gives you a relatively inexpensive way to browse through other significant works from the Hippocratic corpus. The Hippocratic corpus is written in Ionic Greek, or a mixture of Attic and Ionic. If you happen to have only learned Attic Greek, let me assure you this is no big deal. After a few pages, as is the case when you read Herodotus, the differences will become second nature. In fact, if you get the Hayes Nimus reader, they show you all the major differences in a few simple tables. For example, Terus, uncontracted teraos, kentai, keuntai, hora, ionic with an eta, hore, korai, kore, bora an, bora en, he auton, an ionic with a different diphthong and no contraction, he oi teon, monos, munos, pos, ionic with a kappa, kos, hopos, hokos, Ionic differs in the dative plural, tais, tesi, alelois, aleloisin, and participle of emi, on, eon, onta, 
e anta, uses, e uses, etc. The aspiring physician must learn the effects on health of the changes of the seasons and for a given city the prevailing winds, sources of water, soil conditions, and dietary habits of the citizens. In the best tradition of Greek literature, you know a lot about what this work is about from the very first word and sentence. Ietrikein hostis bulletai orthos zdetein tade kre poein. Whoever would correctly study the art of medicine must do the following things. Proton men en thumestai tas horas tu eteos hoti dunatai apergazdestai hekaste. Ugar eoikasin alelesin uden ala polu dia perusin autaita he oiteon kai intesi metabolesin. First, ponder the seasons of the year and what each can affect. For they are not all the same, but rather differ considerably, both taken by themselves and in their changes. Quicunque artem medicam integer ad sequivelet, primum quidem temporum anirationem habere debet, quantum potentia quod libet eorum valaat, non enem simile quicquam in illis existit, verum differunt inwicem propter varias quae in eis fiunt mutationes. Hora in Greek, as defined in Liddell and Scott, is any period fixed by natural laws and revolutions, whether of the year, month, or day. All these periods are captured in this sentence from Xenophon's Reminiscences of Socrates. Ekeloa de Hosocrates, kai astrologias emperus gignestai, kai tautes mentoi mekri tu nyptoste horan, kai menos, kai eniau tu dunastai gignosken. Similarly, Socrates recommended that they familiarize themselves with astronomy, but only so far as to be able to find the time of night, and of month, and of year. Notice there are two Greek words for year, ho eniautos and to etos. The period meant by horai in Hippocrates is the seasons, as it did in Homer and Hesiod. In the world of Homer and Hesiod, there were three seasons, spring, summer, and winter. For example, in this passage from a speech in the Iliad, where the seasonal marker is a thick burst of newly grown leaves. Hoega pulon genae, toede kai andron. Pula tamen tanamos kamadiskee, ala death hule teleta osa pue, e aros de epiginetai hore. As is the generation of leaves, so is that of humanity. The wind scatters the leaves on the ground, but the live timber burgeons with leaves again in the season of spring returning. And in this passage from Hesiod's Works and Days, where the seasonal marker is the chirping cicada. Emos descolumost anthe kai ekatatetix dendro ep esdomenos liguren katakewet aoeden pugnon hupopterugon terra os kamatode os hore. When the golden thistle blooms and the chirping cicada sitting in a tree incessantly pours out its clear-sounding song from under its wings in the season of toilsome summer. And in this passage from Works and Days, where the seasonal marker is the whooping crane. Pras destai delt an geranu ponen epakuses, Hypsothen ek nepe on eni ausia kekleguies, het arotoio te sema per e kai kematos horen degnue ombre ru. Take notice when you hear the voice of the crane every year calling from above out of the clouds. She brings the sign for plowing and indicates the season of winter rain. Notice the adverbial any ausia annually. 
in Comenius, the beginnings on the firmament, you learned Horai first in its generic meaning of periods, as marked in this case by the annual progression of the stars and constellations. Astra cursu temporum vices dimete antur. Ta astra tas ton horon stropas metre. In Latin, tempora was used for periods and more particularly seasons. Tempestates also meant seasons as well as weather. So Comenius's Greek translator translated temporum vices as ton horon stropas. Hippocrates designates the change of seasons as metabolai, but W. H. S. Jones, in his introduction to the Loeb edition, cautions that Hippocrates' metabolai ton horon meant more than the mere successions of the seasons. For his interpretation, Jones refers to the second century CE physician Galen and his commentary or hypomnemata on another work from the Hippocratic corpus called Aphorisms. The third section of Aphorisms is about, as Galen puts it in his Proemion, Hippocrates' sayings about the seasons and the ages of man. Periton catatas horas tecahelikias hippocrate gegramenon. The first aphorism of this section reads, Hai metabolai ton horeon malista tictusi nosemata, kai entesin horesin hai megalai metabolai e psuxios e talpsios kai tala catalogon hutos. The changes of the seasons are especially liable to beget diseases, as are great changes in the seasons between cold and heat and the other changes of the kind, meaning sudden changes from wet to dry, etc. Galen's commentary then begins with an exegesis of the phrase metabolai horon. Metabolas horon enioi nomisdusi legasthai Kathas es alelas metabalusin, hos ekai diadokas tas metabolas ereke. Some think that by metabolas horon is meant how the seasons succeed one another, as if he might equally have used the term diadokas, which is another Greek word for succession. But, Galen goes on to say, in Hippocrates' writings, the succession of seasons not only begets diseases, but sometimes also healing. Galen then focuses his attention on the word malista and concludes, amenon toinunisti diaten prostekein, that is the addition of the qualifier malista, tas metabolas acuen tas katatin krasin auton aloioses. Because of this addition of malista, it is better to understand metabolas as the alterations brought about by the mixtures, meaning violent mixtures, of the seasons. Hautai gar esin hai malista tictusai nosus, hotan ep exes aloi oses osi pleus. For it is these mixtures that most beget diseases, when there are many alterations in succession. And when speaking of a single season, he goes on to say, He de mias horas aloiosis mones ergazdetai men nosustinas al umalista, and an alteration within a single season produces some diseases, but not the most. Pot un malista nosaginontai kata mian horan aloiotesan. When then do diseases most occur as a result of an altered condition within a single season? Hotan sumbe megalen esestai ten metabolen. When it happens that the change is a big one. Kai dia tud epen ho hippocrates kai entesin horesin hai megalai metabolai epsuxios etalpsios kai taloipa. And for that reason, Hippocrates said, quote, and it is the big changes in the seasons of cold and hot and the like that beget diseases. And this is how we should take the phrase metabolai horon in AWP, says Jones, 
that is, as meaning the succession of seasons, but especially violent changes in conditions across or within the seasons. In Comenius, The Beginnings on the Firmament, you also learned horai in its particular sense of periods of the day, i.e. hours. Sol revolutione sua de es viginti quatuo horis definit. Ho helios te strope hemeran horais ecosi tetarsi perigrape. Horai in Latin primarily means hours, the meaning it bequeathed to the Romance languages in English. Latin use of horai as seasons is chiefly poetic. But while the word horai in Latin prose primarily meant hours, the number and names and functions of the goddesses horai varied across place and time in antiquity. In this Roman copy of a Hellenistic relief, they represent seasons and number three. And to refresh your memory, here are the names of the seasons. At some point in Greek history, fall was added as a fourth season to the three seasons in Homer and Hesiod. The name you learned for fall in Comenius was He Opora. Technically, Opora meant late summer, more specifically, the period between the heliacal rising of the dog star Sirius mid July and the heliacal rising of Arcturus in mid September. You remember these first magnitude bright stars from Comenius, the beginnings on constellations. Hoserios, Latin Sirius, is the brightest star in the constellation Canis Maior in the southern celestial hemisphere. In fact, the brightest star in Earth's night sky. The Greeks called Canis Maior simply Hokuon, dog, and Sirius is the dog star, the harbinger of the dog days, the period of the hottest summer weather, as you know from Comenius, the beginnings on the firmament. Sirius excitat aistum, gignetai kataten anatolen tu seriu heton kaumaton epitasis. Arcturus is the brightest star in the constellation Bootes and the brightest star in the northern celestial hemisphere. Besides the solstices, tropi, and equinoxes, isemeriae, of the planet Sun, remember the Sun was a planet that is, a wandering star, a planetes aster, many events in the ancient year were marked by the rising and setting of the fixed stars. To understand the ancient calendar, it is important to know that there are three types of risings and settings, a chronical, meaning evening, heliacal, and cosmic. For concise definitions of all of these, see the Hayes Nimus edition and Jones's introduction to the lobe. We're concerned with heliacal risings for the moment because the beginning and end of He Opora are marked by the heliacal rising of Sirius and Arcturus, respectively. A heliacal rising is when a star first becomes briefly visible in the eastern sky just before sunrise. This is nicely illustrated in Sky and Telescope's recreation of the early morning sky on July 15, 3000 BCE from the ancient city of Memphis in Egypt. The heliacal rising of Sirius coincided for the Egyptians with the rising of the Nile. So the word He Opora was sometimes used for fall, but was technically the dog days of late summer. To thin oporon, the waning opora, and to met oporon, the period after opora, became the correct terms for fall. Hippocrates used met oporon. A parapegma is an astronomical and meteorological calendar, like a farmer's almanac, that marks the days with movable pegs. The information in the lower left of the slide is from a literary parapegma, specifically a section in a work by a Byzantine physician of the 6th century CE named Aetius of Amida. Aetius specifies the stellar risings and settings that were thought to coincide with violent winds, 
which were of concern to physicians then as they were almost a millennium earlier to Hippocrates. Meni yulioi en akaidika kuon heoios epitele. On the nineteenth day of the Julian month, the dog rises at dawn. Notice how the Byzantine Greeks used the Roman names for months. With Aetius as his source, Jones, in his Loeb introduction, lists the stellar risings and settings, along with their dates, that are most important to Hippocrates' air, water, places. Iechiken hostis bulatai otos deten, tada kre poien, proton men enthumestai tas horas tu eteos, hoti dunatai apergazdestai hekaste, Ugar eoikasin alelesin uden, ala polu diaperusin autaita he oiteon, kai entesi metabolesin. Quicunque artem medicam integer ad sequivelet, primum quidem temporum ani rationem habere debet, quantum potentia quod libet eorum valaat. Non enum simile quicquam in illis existed, verum differunt inwicem propter varias quae in eis fiunt mutationes. Epeta de ta pneumata ta thermata kai ta psukra. Malista men ta koina pasin anthropoisin, epeta de kai ta en hecaste core epicoria e onta. Next, he must ponder the winds, both hot and cold, especially on the one hand those common to all countries, but also those peculiar to each region. Dende ventorum calidorumque et frigidorum maxime qui ex his omnibus hominibus sunt communes, et mox qui in una quaque regione sunt indigenae et proprii. From Comenius, the beginnings, de meteoris, periton meteoron, you know the two main Greek words for winds, hoi animoi, and topnelmata, although topnelma there in Comenius meant the violent underground wind stirred up by Vulcan that causes earthquakes. You also had the verb pneo, he aura pne praos, ho animos de iscuros, aura spirat lenete ventus flat walde. De de kai ton hudaton enthumestai tas dynamias, hospergar entoi stomati dia perusi, kai entoi stat moi, huta kai he dynamis dia pere polu he castu. It is also necessary to ponder the properties of the waters, for just as they differ in taste in one's mouth and in what they weigh on the scale, so the property of each differs greatly, and the property or dunamis is both the inherent and permanent quality of the water and its effect on human health. Nequo vero negla gentiorum se circa aquarum facultates cognoscendas exhibere convenit, quem admodum enem gustu differunt et pone ac statione, sic quoque virtute Alla ai alla is longe praestant. Hoste es polin epedan ap icetai tis heis aperosesti, dia prontisai cre tentesin autes, hocos cetai, cae prosta pneumata, cae prostas anatolas tu heliu. So that when someone arrives in a town he is unfamiliar with, he must consider its placement with respect to the winds and to the risings of the sun. 
The author narrows his target audience from that of aspiring physician, Iatricain hostis bulletai orthos zdetain, to that of the aspiring itinerant physician. This is a very important aspect of ancient medicine. The most famous itinerant physician in Greek history was Demosedes of Croton, described by Herodotus, in Ionic Greek of course, as Iatros ta eon, kaiten technen askeon arista ton kat he oiton. Notice he calls it a techne. As told brilliantly by Herodotus, the storyteller Saint Paré, Demosedes ended up as a prisoner of war in the court of the Persian king Darius the Great, where he found favor with Darius after curing a growth on the breast of Atosa, one of Darius's wives. Ugar tauto dunatai hetis pros bore in ketai, ka hetis pros noton, ud hetis pros helion an iskonta, ud pros dunonta. For a town situated facing Boreas and one facing Notos cannot have the same effect, nor one facing the rising sun and one the setting sun. Quare siquis ad urbem sibi incognitam perveniat, circumspicere oportet eius situm, quomodo scilicet ad ventos et solus exhortus jaceat. Non enum aequales vires sunt ad septentrionum citae et vergentes ad austrum, neque eius quae solum exorientem et quae eundem occidentem spectat. You are well equipped from your study of Comenius the elements de meteoris periton meteoron to recognize how Hippocrates here expresses directions. You should go back and review that presentation, but here is an abbreviated reprise. Recall that in his work Ta Metaorologica, Aristotle superimposed the names of winds on a diagram of the cardinal and ordinal directions, creating what was to be called by navigators a compass rose or wind rose. We've simplified Aristotle's system here to an eight-wind system. The cardinal directions are the equinoctial rising and setting of the sun, Anatole, Ortus, and Ducis, Ocasus. The constellation the Greeks called He Arctos and the combination of Arctos and Ursa Minor, the Romans called the Septentriones, and the location of the sun at midday Mesembria Meridaes. The ordinal directions are the solstitial risings and solstitial settings of the sun. Next, the winds. Homer, you'll recall, knew of at least four winds, but the only two whose location is certain are the ones just used by Hippocrates, Boreas and Notos. Aristotle superimposed the names of the winds on the directions. Boreas and Notos, Apeliotes and Zdepuros, and the others. We, in turn, superimposed the Roman names. Septentrio and Auster or Notus, Subsolanus and Fawonius or Zephyrus, and the remainder that filled out Seneca's twelve wind system. Hoste es polin epedan ap iketai tis his aperosesti, diaprontisai cre tentesin autes, hocos ketai, kai prosta pneumata, kai prostas anatolas tu heliu. Ugar tau to dunatai, hetis pros bore en ketai, kai hetis pros noton, ud hetis pros helion an iskonta, ud pros dunonta. Non enem aequales vires sunt ad septentrionem citae et vergentes ad austrum, 
neque eius quae solum ex orientem et quae et undem occidentem spectat. By the way, I said I'm underlying the vocabulary in AWP that you have already learned in Comenius. I'm usually only underlying the first occurrence of the word. Also, if you learned the Greek noun ducis in Comenius for the setting of a star, then as far as I'm concerned, you know, for example, the cognate verb duo and its variant duno. Or if you learned the words ora ains and ortus in Comenius, then you know the words ex ora ains and ex ortus, etc. Having just restated his point about the winds from the perspective of the itinerant physician, the author returns to the importance of water and its various types. Tauta de cre entumestae hos calista, cae ton hudaton peri hos ecusi, cae poteron helodesi creontai cae malacoisin, escleroisi te cae ec meteoron cae ec petrodeon, eta halucoisi te cae ateramnoisi. He must ponder these things with the greatest care, and also the condition of their water supply and in particular whether they use water that is marshy and soft, or that is hard and from rocky heights, or that is brackish and harsh. Haec itaque diligenter oportet per scrutari, ac simul quomodo habeant circa e am aquae, num ne palustribus utantur et molibus, aut duris et ex sublimi loco prolabentibus et scaturentibus, siwe salsis et crudis. A few notes about vocabulary. Again, since you know to helos, swamp, and ho petros, rock, I assume you know or can easily figure out their adjectives swamp-like and rock-like formed by adding the common suffix odes, odes. The author's first type of water is swampish and soft. We'll learn later what Hippocrates thought from a health perspective about stagnant waters from swamps. You learned from Comenius that a swamp or palus is a scaturigo, that is, a bubbling spring. In Greek, a helos is polypidox, but stagnant, sine fluxu. Hold on to that word scaturigo for a minute. Janus Cornarius' Latin translation of Hippocrates' second type of water, hard water from high rocky places, is kind of interesting. Cornarius takes an image that is implicit in Hippocrates' text that the water is flowing or gushing downhill to the city and makes it explicit. Ex sublimi loco prolabentibus et scaturentibus. Scaturigo was one of my favorite onomatopoeic words from Comenius's De Aquis, which we celebrated thusly. Hippocrates distinguishes hard and soft water. You know the words for hard and soft as applied to metals in the Orbis Pictus Metalla. And from the Janua De Metallis Periton Metallon, you know that salt Greek hals, Latin sal, was a succus concretus in the chemistry of Comenius's day. From hals we get halukos and halmiros, words you'll see often in the Hippocratic corpus. Ateramnos is a relatively rare word and its only occurrences in the Hippocratic corpus are in AWP. It is cognate with words like teren, terena, teren, soft, tera to weaken, teramon, teramonos, becomes soft by boiling. Thus, a teramnos in coctilis, durus. Erosion was a grammarian from the first century CE. He wrote an extant glossary of words in Hippocrates, and he defined a teramnos as dus metabletois, difficult or impossible to change. Taute de cre entumestae hos calista, cae ton hudaton peri hos ecusi, cae poteron helodesi creontae cae malacoisin, escleroisite cae ec meteoron cae petrodeon, 
eta halu koesi te kai ateran noisi. Haik ita kwe diligenter oportet perscutari, ak simul quomodo habe ant kirka e am aquae, num ne palustribus utantur et molibus, aut duris et ex sublimi loco prolabentibus et scatura entibus, siwe salsis et crudis. Cae ten gen, poteron psilete cae anudros e dasea cae epudros, cae eta en coiloi kemene cae pnigere, eta meteoros cae psucre. And the soil, whether it is bare and dry, or thickly covered with vegetation and moist, and whether it is situated in a hollow and is stifling, or in a high place exposed and cold. Terra et diam ipsa consideranda, nuda ne sit et aquis carens, aut densa et aquosa, et an concava sit et aestuosa, vel alta et frigida. Jacques Joanna points out the Greek rhetorical style of writing here, even in a scientific work. An outer pair of properties, the condition of the soil and the nature of its location, each enclosing an inner pair of opposing states of two members each, all perfectly symmetrical. Psileta kai anudros, edasea kai epudros, and en koiloi kemene kai pnigere, the second members of each state are a homeoteleton, a pair of words in near rhyme, of equal length an udros epudros, and of almost equal length pnigere psucre. To make it even more interesting, when these different states of the soil or earth come up again, which is in the final chapter of the ethnography and of AWP as a whole, all these conditions are discussed, but precisely in the reverse order, first of the outer pairs and then of the pairs within. The three major themes around which AWP is organized are the seasons, the winds, and the waters. But besides the soil, Hippocrates here at the end of chapter 1 says that regimen, what we might call lifestyle, is another important item for the aspiring itinerant physician to study. But the regimen of the inhabitants only gets scattered attention in the remainder of the work. Kaiten diaitan ton anthropon hokoye herontai, poteron pilopotai kai aristetai kai atalaiporoi, e pilogymnastai te kai piloponoi, kai edodoi kai apotoi, and the regimen that is pleasing to the inhabitants, whether they love drink and heavy midday meals and are not given to hard work, or they exercise and are not work-averse and like a healthy meal but drink sparely. Homenum insuper di aita per quirenda qua maxime cape antor, an bibulicent et lurcones et ota odedeti, Aut exercitiis vareis utentes et tolerantes laborum, ciborumque plus ad patentes quam poculorum. There is also a rhetorical figure here, that of chiasmus. Hippocrates defines a bad regimen and a good one in that order. Regimen consists of three components, drink, food, and exercise. He reverses the order of the three components in the second regimen. Each of the three components are meant to be opposites. That is clear for the first and third components, drink, pilopotai, and apotoi, and exercise, atalaiporoi kai pilogymnastai te kai piloponoi. However, that is not clear with food, since both terms, aristetai and edodoi, mean to eat a lot. What is an aristetes? The word is a hapax legomenon, that is, it only appears this one place in the body of ancient writing. In Homer, to ariston was the morning meal, later the midday meal. Hence, an aristetes is an eater of a midday meal. 
in the standard explanation then, and our restate taste here in AWP is someone who eats too heavily midday, while someone who is edodos eats a hearty but healthy meal. Kiborum plus ad petens quam poculorum in Cornarius's translation. Ietricen hostis bulletai or tos zdeten tada cre poien. In your Comanian studies, you've learned about the firmament, about fire, earth, water, and air, including winds and weather phenomena, and about the rocks, minerals, and metals growing on the earth. You may not have realized it, but this has helped prepare you to be an itinerant Greek physician, one who knows the different seasons and who can assess the prevailing winds, water sources, and soil type of any unfamiliar city you visit. My recommendation is that you now go back and reread chapter one once or twice on your own. Then, to better recognize and predict the seasons, you will need to exercise your already formidable knowledge of astronomy.